I tell you, it's one of the great miracles, I, I think, in life that, that you take an instrument and a voice and with words and you make this space in the world. Yeah. And the song lives in that and, and an audience that is attentive to that. And nobody wants that spell broken, you know? And it's one of the most magical things to be in a concert hall where, the, where, it, where it just stops, where it just stops. Because we want to stay in that. I, uh, and we're in that, you can feel it now. Description. Yeah. It is, a, it is a space. And you know, when, when there's a particular response like this, you know, I, I, I take it as a kind of ambassador for Sam and James, you know, Aggie. <laughs> sure, we have to make it, we have to bring it back alive. But, you know, that's to me the miracle of song is that, is that the, the writer is using, a, is using a language in the poetic form that is imploding, not exploding, but imploding and searching for the right context that essentially enlivens the metaphor that has meaning. It's what Walt Whitman called suggestiveness, right? <laughs> and then the composer comes along and, and gets that suggestiveness, and by his musical language, and music is a language, they enter into a dialogue where they search together without ever knowing one another, very often, That's wonderful. the same metaphor. And this dialogue is just an amazing world to live in. And that's what, whether you know it or not, you know, you don't have to be a specialist by any means, you know, but we all as human beings, that's what makes us vibrate. That's when we feel alive and communicate, communicated as people, when those things happen to us. The performer, especially the vocal performer, it seems to me, um, other musicians have something to lean on, whether, <laughs> whether, you know, whether it's a keyboard yeah, I'm a or, pianist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I guess that's true. Um, but the art moves through you, and you sing texts that are extraordinarily powerful. The wound dresser oh. is incredibly beautiful, incredibly sad, incredibly moving. How do you stay out of the way? And Probably how do you and how do you avoid becoming so involved that you're not overcome? Because if you are overcome, then you can't produce the sound anymore. How does a performer deal with that? Well, first of all, I believe very firmly that that is our responsibility. I think that the end goal and is 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 that we get out of the way. I, I do not want to see Tosca break down in tears in Visidarte. I want those words to be her tears. And, and quite frankly, when you study poetry or songs or whatever it might be of, of intense emotional impact, which you must inhabit, part of the rehearsal process is working through that. I mean, Craig and I have had experiences where we just had to stop and say, I, you know, we got to take a walk, have a coffee or something. This is just, you know, just overwhelming. And, and we get through that because in, the, in fact, you know, performance, the recreative process must have at the core of it a very cool center that allows all of the element, elements of those things that must be brought to life to have their just life. I must get out of it. I've cried over the wound dresser. I'm, I'm, I'm past that now. I, I know what that is. And also, I don't think Walt Whitman cried writing this poetry. By the time he got to writing the poetry, I think he had some tears on the page when he wrote his mother and some of the, and in fact, many of the letters that, that he, he writes at that period of time and when he was working as a, as a self-dedicated, self-appointed nurse in Washington, D.C., attending to, as he described, between 60 and 80,000 young men in a 280, 200, or two and a half year period, you know, it, and it broke his health. I mean, he had an absolute health, and I mean, a nervous breakdown. And, and when, he, when he finally left the hospital, you can see the picture, you can graphically see this physically able, strong, brilliant guy down there in 1860. And then in 1864, the, the hair is completely white, it's thinned, you know, and, and then he looks better about five or ten years later, you know. So, I mean, all of that impact, but I think that, I think that, I think the, the, the point is that I, I guess metaphor is the, you know, metaphor doesn't mean that something is like something. It doesn't mean that it's, it reflects on something. It literally transposes something. And I think that's where both the information, the suggestiveness, and the relief 
in intensive poetry is because it stands for that which is unimaginable, unspeakable, perhaps not even livable, you know? But it's some place that we all desperately must have in our souls to be complete human beings. So the, the, the Whitman has been very powerful for you, all the Whitman poetry and the thousands of settings of his songs. Um, Stephen Foster has been huge to you. Yeah. Who else have you ferreted out besides uh, uh, Francis Hopkinson, the My Days Have Been So Wondrous Free? Francis in, Hopkinson in the, was a great in the American guy, song. You know? he, he became one of the first uh, uh, district, you know, big judges. It wasn't quite a Supreme Court yet, but he was a, he was a friend of Washington, of, of Washington and, um, and was a very powerful uh, uh, lawyer. And he was also a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, which is quite, quite fun. He was an extraordinary guy. Stephen Foster becomes sort of the watershed of what becomes what we're now calling classic song instead of art song. Just because art song, people get, I don't know, it just kind of freezes people sometimes. And we've been looking for, I think classic song makes sense. It's essentially since the genres of music through the ubiquitousness of bookstores and, and, and online, you know, we have, we have a classic place. So what are we talking about? A classic song represents poetry set to music. And that's what this is all about. When we talk about American song, there are m as many different songs as there are cultures and, and people in this country. I am focused on, on the poetic narrative. It's really even more of a history project, quite frankly, the whole Song of America, than it is, than it is arts and, and letters. There, have been, there are some wonderful, wonderful stories, and they're, and they're on this album, they're on some other albums as well. Uh, you mentioned John Duke. John Duke wrote more songs than Massenet. And Massenet wrote just a few more than Richard Strauss. So you have to kind of get that perspective in your mind. He's one of the, one of the great songwriters, uh, uh, spent most of his life in, life in academia. People who know American song know John Duke, but why he's not just, you know, he's a wonderful songwriter. Sidney Homer, who, who set that marvelous poem, General Booth Enters Into Heaven, uh, was Samuel Barber's uncle. He was the husband of Louise Homer, who was the contralto colleague of most of Caruso's performances at the Metropolitan. So this is the world that Samuel Barber was born into. And Sidney Homer was the first person to be extraordinarily encouraging to Samuel Barber that he should compose and, and become who he was. And um, oh, who are some of the other guys? I mean, Loeffler is a wonderful story. Charles Griffiths, my goodness, what a wonderful story that is. You know, turn of the century. Henry Burley first African-American composer of, of note, as they say, in this country, went to school on a scholarship by Edward McDowell's mother, <laughs> you know? I mean, there's just, like I said, the layers behind this is just, is great fun. If I may be so, may be so uh, candid, I mean, these, I'm passionate, as you can see, about these stories. And so we made, the Hamsung Foundation has actually made a website to accompany this whole, as you see, the materials of, of Song of America and all of that, uh, this great and glorious project. And it is called, www.songofamerica.net. And songofamerica.net is an interactive database of poetry, poem, poem, poet, composer, song, timeline. And it moves in three dimensions. And when you need more information, because we have enough websites, <laughs> what we're going to get better at is building aggregators and dashboards. And so there's quite a bit of information on this site, and it will just get deeper and deeper. If you're in a poem and it's by this particular poet, well, who else said him? Ah, you know. And there's other websites that have done this for a long time, not what I'm doing, but for instance, that particular question. So we, we give you a link which launches a new window, takes you ex ex precisely to that composer or that poet that you're dealing with in that page. In the middle of the page that you're, that you're reading on Song of America, there's a resource. So you've got Library of Congress. You've got poets.org. You've got any particular, you know, samuelbarber.com or waltwhitman.org or whatever it is. We, we run all the main links. And then there's a resource page of links beyond links. So it's a real, it's a real dashboard for, for either students to, to learn more about American Song but quite frankly, my passion in all of this is not K-12. My passion is, are the several, and unfortunately we now can say several, X generations that have come and gone through a, a schooling system in this country and who haven't been invited to understand their own culture at all.